Today we're going to be welcoming John Carlson, who is a professor in MCDB here at Yale, which stands for Molecular Cellular Developmental Biology. So it's our biology department. So, but we like to have big names at Yale. Um, John actually, he got his bachelor's degree at another school, which we often at Yale don't like to talk about, somewhere in the Boston area. Um, but it turns out they do produce really brilliant people. And his PhD at Stanford, and now he's here at Yale, he, even though he looks to be about 12 years old. And I have to be honest, when I first met him, I thought it was really great that they brought in such young people to be uh, speaking at the thing I was speaking at. It turns out he is a full professor and fantastic with two great kids. Um, I asked him how he actually got interested in science. Because that's sort of, you know, people have all sorts of stories. And it turned out he wanted to be a zookeeper. So, you know, the obvious thing was to go into biology. And as you can see, he keeps quite an interesting zoo up here of, I believe he said it's approximately six million fruit flies at any given time in his laboratory, which is a large number to keep track of. So, with that, I'd like to welcome him. He's going to be speaking today on how fruit flies find bananas and how mosquitoes find us. So, please give him a warm welcome. Well, thanks, Aaron, for that very generous introduction. It's great to be here. You know, I've actually been to most of these Science Saturdays with my kids, partly because my kids like them, but mostly because I like them. <laughs> so I feel uh, very honored to actually be giving one, but also a little bit intimidated because I know how terrific all the previous ones have been. So what I'd like to talk to you today is about olfaction, which is the sense of smell. And olfaction is very important in the animal world because animals use uh, olfaction to find food and to locate mates and to avoid predators. And what food mates and predators all emit are these little molecules called odorants. These are odors. These are the molecules that we actually smell. All right? And different molecules, different odorants, elicit very different sensations in, in, in us and other animals. Uh, benzaldehyde here uh, smells like almond. Uh, this compound here smells like rose. This smells just like buttered popcorn. This is like peppermint, lemon, mushroom. This smells like a barnyard. <laughs> so uh, a critical question is, how is it that animals detect and identify these odors? Okay. So in other words, how is it that these different odors, different smells, are encoded by olfactory organs, like the nose, or in the case of, um, <coughs> in the case of insects, antennae? How is it that these olfactory organs produce an, an internal representation inside the brain? How do they send signals to the brain informing the animal of which odors are out there? So most of the work I'm going to talk to you about today was done in insects. And this is partly because insects just have fantastically sensitive olfactory systems. As a matter of fact, most or a lot of what we've learned about olfaction, the sense of smell, has been learned from study of insects. This insect here, it's a moth. And believe it or not, it's that its antenna is capable of, of detecting a single molecule of a female pheromone. So this is a male here. And it can pick up one molecule, which is just incredibly sensitive. And just a few hundred molecules are enough to make this guy turn around and start flying upwind in search of the female. <coughs> so you can see that the antennae here are very elaborate. They're just wonderful structures here. Lots of surface area to capture and to identify these odors. So actually, insect antennae come in all different sizes and shapes and colors. They're really quite beautiful. So I just brought a few pictures of these. Here's one of very feathery. And here's another one of these black and white stripes you can see here. Um, here's a, a pixelated locust with a, an antenna here. And here's another beautiful moth. This is a silkworm moth, Bombyx mori. Look at all that. Now, uh, here's another one with nice black and white stripes here. So, um, or one with nice beads on it. Isn't that cool? So, um, oh, and then here's one, uh, another moth. And you know, I actually brought with me today uh, one of these moths. It's right in this, this thing over here, along with a couple of African butterflies. So after the, the lecture, you can actually come up and actually see this guy, Antheria polyphemus. All right, so insect olfaction is interesting to study, be partly because these antennae are so beautiful, but it's also very important in the real world. All right, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First, about 30%, 30% of the world's agricultural output is damaged every year, either directly or indirectly, by insects. 
Okay, that's just an enormous uh, economic problem. And these are a whole variety of different insects, including boll weevils here. Okay, and this guy here infests about 10 million acres of, of cotton fields in the U.S. alone. Here's a, a grasshopper which eats corn, alpha, soy, alfalfa, soybeans, cotton, all kinds of different crops. Um, here's a, a bug which eats sorghum. Uh, here's a, a weevil that's about to start eating a, a kernel of a grain. Here's before his meal and here's after his meal so you can see what he's done to this. Here's another little beetle that's eaten flour in storage. So you can see there's just a, an enormous economic problem. And I, these are the adults. Okay, but also I think most of you know that insects have a life cycle where or many of them at least lay eggs which then hatch into larvae. Some larvae are called caterpillars. And in lots of species it's these larvae that actually do most of the damage to agriculture. So here's a, a worm from a, a moth and you can see what it's doing to this cabbage leaf. Okay, and here's a no one that uh, does tremendous devastation to corn crops. All right, and then one last one is a, a caterpillar that eats a lot of tomato plants. Now, a lot of these insects um, find their, the plants that they eat, the crops that they eat, um, through their sense of smell. Through okay. So they, uh, so if basically if we can understand better how olfaction works, we might be able to prevent them from finding their plant hosts. So this tremendous devastation that insects do to agriculture is one important reason for studying insect olfaction. But there's another reason too, and that's that about a third of the world's population is affected by diseases that are transmitted by insects. And these are some really terrible diseases like malaria, okay, which affects about 10 million, 10% uh, of the, the world's population every year. There's also a dengue fever and yellow fever, African sleeping sickness, Japanese encephalitis, and now in this country we have West Nile encephalitis. And again, most of these insects find us, find their human hosts, primarily through their sense of smell. They smell us. Okay, so if we can understand the molecular and cellular basis of how olfaction works in insects, we may be able to come up with new ways of preventing them from finding us, sort of jamming their olfactory systems. Now, most of the work I'm going to talk to you about today was done in the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. And here's a picture of one. You can see here's one laying an egg. All right, and I actually brought some of these for you to, to show you. And don't worry, they're not harmful. They're not radioactive. They don't bite. They're actually quite, quite uh, elegant creatures. Um, so if you can uh, <coughs> you pass one up, up and then one in the back, so if you want to pass one. <coughs> Okay, so why study uh, Drosophila, this fruit fly? And one reason is it has just wonderful genetics. And by that I mean it's very easy to study its genes. For example, you can take a gene out of one of these flies and, and manipulate it. Um, and then you can put it back in another fly and see what happens to the changes you've made. How does the changes you've made in that gene affect its function? Also, flies have uh, very short generation times. It's about two weeks between a fertile adult, and then uh, you know, we go through a, an, a, an egg, and then a larva, and a pupa, and then another adult. It only takes two weeks. These guys are very small. They don't eat very much, so they're cheap and easy to keep in the lab. Um, so they're really wonderful animals to work with. And another thing that's nice about them is that people have been studying them for 100 years. Right? So during the course of that 100 years, there's just an enormous number of mutants of flies that have been identified. So they're flies that have and if you, in fact, if you look carefully in these vials I'm passing on, you can see some flies that have curly wings instead of normal straight wings. There are flies that have kind of a dark body color instead of the normal body color. And there are flies that uh, have, if you look very, very, very carefully, you can see some that have white eyes instead of red eyes. All right. And one other advantage is that they have a very small and sequenced genome. And what I mean by that is that they have only about as one twentieth as much DNA in their chromosomes as we do, and we know the complete nucleotide sequence, all the A's and C's and G's and T's that make up their chromosomes. We know all of that. All right, so, uh, so next, flies are very small and simple, okay? So they have only about a thousand olfactory uh, neurons, uh, nerve cells in their antennae, whereas we have hundreds of millions, so they're very easy to study in that sense, too. So, flies are sensitive to just a, an enormous, sen uh, enormous array of different uh, compounds. And they sense these through the antenna right here. 
And the antenna is covered with about 400 sensory hairs, or sensilla as I'll call them. Here's a picture of one. And if you look carefully, you can see there's tiny pores in this hair through which odors can pass. Here's a little drawing here. So you can see the odors passing through these, uh, these holes. And each one of these hairs has got neurons or nerve cells. So we'll use those two words to be the same. A neuron is a nerve cell. And there's up to four of them which send little processes up into this hair. All right? And then here's the sort of the body of the cell. And it's going to send another long process down into the brain. Okay, where it's going to terminate in a structure here called the antennal lobe. And this looks very much like the olfactory bulb in humans. So there's a lot of very strong similarities between olfaction in the fly and the human. And then there's more processes in the fly brain that go up to these strange shaped structures here called mushroom bodies, which have been implicated in olfactory learning and memory. So have any of you ever had this experience where, you know, you, you catch a whiff of an odor and all of a sudden it very vividly reminds you of some place or some incident of your past? Has that ever happened to any of you? Like, what, when did that happen to you? Anything in, comes to mind that you sense something that uh, reminds you of some place very early? It happens to me a lot. I just can't, I go into a pizza place and smell something and all of a sudden it reminds me of something I've been before. Well, flies also have a very sophisticated sense of learning and memory. Okay, so what I'd like to tell you now is how we can actually measure the response of individual cells in the antenna to different odors. And this is how we do it. We take a fly right here, and we use an airstream to blow them up into the end of this little plastic micropipette tip. So it's just this little thing about this high. It's yellow. And we push him up here so that his head sort of lodged here with his antennae sticking out. Okay, and then we can put an electrode in his antenna. Okay. And, you know, people sometimes ask me whether this hurts the fly. And I never know quite how to answer that. But what I can tell you is at the end of the experiment, you can take this fly out and he flies around, runs all over the place, he mates, he seems happy. So I don't think it hurts too much. So what this little electrode does, this little piece of wire, it goes right into one of these sensory hairs, all right, with the nerve cells that send these processes up. And so you can measure the response of these nerve cells, okay, A and B, to any odor that you put on the fly, okay? And let me just tell you a little bit how that works. And I should mention that you can tell the difference between the response of this cell from the difference of the response of this cell because they give electrical signals. And the electrical signal given off by A is bigger than the electrical signal given off by B. And I'll also have more to say about that in just a sec. So here's what we're measuring. So these are nervous impulses. Here's one impulse, another one, another one, another one, another one. And these are usually called action potentials, action potentials. And sometimes they're called spikes. So all those are the same, nervous impulses, action potentials, and spikes. And what they are is they're little changes in the voltage across one of these nerve cells. So what happens, um, just very briefly, is that there's a little hole in the cell, little holes called channels. And these will open up and a, some charged ions will move through ions that can be positively or negatively charged. And those change the voltage across the cell. So you get this little change in voltage here. That's what we're measuring here, OK? But it's very quick. It only lasts a few milliseconds. That's why this is so short. So this is the time scale here. So it's just a little blip, another blip, another blip. So these nerve cells fire these action potentials spontaneously. All right, and here's um, a nerve cell that just fires a few, a low frequency. Here's one that spontaneously fires more. And the last thing I need to tell you about these, these action potentials, or spikes, is they move down the nerve on. They move, move down all the way into the brain. So they're sending information from the antenna into the brain. That's what they do. So that's sort of how the, the brain figures out what's going, out there, going on out in the outside world, is because of these action potentials that move down these nerve cells into the brain. OK, so here are some sort of spontaneous action potentials. But now what happens if we get a whiff of odor? Here's just a half second pulse of ethyl acetate, which smells kind of fruity. Well, what you can see is that the, we get this big burst of action potentials here. All right, it's a train of these things that it goes very quickly. And if you look carefully, they're all the big action potentials. They all come from what we call the A cell, the one that makes the big action potentials. The B cell that makes the little action potentials, I've marked that with dots. And you can see that doesn't respond to this odor. So in other words, if you give a pulse of ethyl acetate, then the A cell starts firing like crazy. The frequency of these signals goes up. By contrast, um, in this same sensillum, remember there's an A cell and a B cell in the same sensillum, if you give a pulse of 4-methylphenol, which smells like a barnyard, 
It's the B cell that responds like crazy, okay? So we have two cells in the same little hair, and one of them is sensitive to this fruity odor, and the other is sensitive to the barnyard odor. Okay, and I just thought it'd be fun just to bring some real um, data that, that, that you can actually hear. Because what we can do is we can hook up, um, not, not only do we see these patterns on an oscilloscope on this little TV screen, but in addition to that, we can hook it up to a loudspeaker, which will actually um, register each one of these action potentials. Now, remember there's two kinds. There's the A action potentials, which are B, or, sorry, the A ones, which come from this A cell, they're big. And then there's the B ones coming from the B cell, which are small. And what you're going to hear is two kinds of sound on this. There's the sort of a high-pitched sound from this A cell and a low-pitched sound coming from the B cell. So this first recording I'm going to show you is just from a spontaneous neuron. There's no odors around. And this is what it sounds like. So the high pitch is the A. And then down below, you can kind of hear the B. OK, so that top sort of staticky sound, that's the A cell. And then if you could hear this rumbling noise down at the bottom, was the B cell. Now let's give it the width of a barnyard. It takes a little bit for it to get started. And then what you're going to hear is this B cell, the, brrr, the real deep one, is going to start going very quickly. So you're going to get a lot of these active potentials. So it's going to make a lot of noise. So listen to this. It takes a little while to get going. Yeah, it's Aaron's stomach that you heard, right? <laughs> but it's also a barnyard that the B cell heard. OK, so what you can do then is you can systematically measure the responses of these cells to a whole panel of different odors. So we've just picked 10 odors here, various different kinds of odors. And we've asked, how strongly does each neuron or nerve cell respond? And we're just counting the number of these action potentials per second, or spikes per second. So this first cell we've looked at responds strongly to ethyl acetate, this fruity odor, but also gives a response to another odor, 2,3-butanedione, and some very weak responses to some other odors. Now here's another cell which responds very strongly to geronyl acetate, which is the odor of rose, okay, very nice floral scent. But it doesn't respond to anything at all, anything other than rose. Okay, so we've got two different nerve cells which respond to different subsets of odors. Okay, so in other words, um, different uh, nerve cells will sort of report the existence of different odors that are out in the environment. So this raises a very important question in olfaction. In an olfactory system like ours or a fly's, how many different types of these nerve cells are there? And how narrow or broad are their specificities? You know, at one extreme, you can imagine that a fly might have a thousand different types of nerve cells, each responding to one specific odor. Or the other extreme, you can imagine there might be a very small number of nerve cells, each responding to lots of odors. So which is it? So a Dutch postdoc came to our lab, and he picked a, a panel of 50 different odors, and he tested them all at high concentrations, and he tested them on all the nerve cells he could find in the antenna. And he found that he could identify 16 different classes of nerve cells, each one indicated by a vertical column here. All right. And so there's 750 entries in this table. And what he found was that about 85% of them were zeros. Only 15% of them um, actually gave a, an appreciable response. So, and that's even testing these odors at very high concentration. So what that tells you is that most of these nerve cells respond to only a small fraction of, of odors. They're, they're quite selective in what they respond to. I've marked the best odor for each neuron in, in yellow. And you can see that they're, they're pretty much different for each neuron type. All right? And the last thing I just want to point out is there was one neuron here that didn't respond to any odor we tried. We couldn't figure out why that was. And then finally, Maureen, this postdoc, had this great idea. And he tried carbon dioxide. The thing went firing like crazy, just a screaming response. And that was kind of interesting, because there are insects like mosquitoes and tsetse flies they actually use carbon dioxide to find us. They're human hosts. So fl these flies seem to have um, a carbon dioxide sensitive cell as well. Now, how are these different cells actually organized on the antenna? Well, they're organized in these sensory hairs, as you can see here. There's one kind of sensory hair that's got four of them, and the others all have two. And they're combined in a very stereotyped way. They're very according to a very strict pairing rule. You always find one of these nerve cells and right next to one of these. You always find one of these nerve cells right next to one of those. And how are they actually distributed on the surface of the antenna? Well, again, there's a lot of order to this. This is the front half of the antenna. 
This is the back half of the antenna. And <coughs> you can find that individual types are restricted to particular regions of the antenna, like the number threes are all up top here and the number sevens are down here. So there's intermingling of different types, but each type has a characteristic distribution on the surface of the antenna. Okay, so this is what I wanted to tell you about the cellular basis, how cells mediate olfaction, the cellular basis of olfaction. Okay, and I've shown you that there's different kinds of cells in the antenna. The different kinds of cells respond to different uh, groups of odors. And I've shown you that the neurons, these nerve cells that respond to odors are combined in these sensory hairs, these sensilla, in a very particular way, and that different sensilla and different neurons are uh, distributed on different parts of the antenna. So that's the cellular basis of olfaction I wanted to talk about. Now let me tell you about the molecular basis of olfaction. How does this all work in terms of molecules? Okay, so in order to get at that, we desperately needed to identify the, the receptors for odors. That is these, the protein molecules that sit in the surfaces of these nerve cells and actually grab out and grab hold of and bind to these odors. Okay, so what are these receptors? Well, it turns out, and I should mention these receptors are the ones which after they bind their odor, they send a little signal to the cell which causes this nerve cell to fire. So the binding of a receptor <coughs> to an odor is what actually makes one of these nerve cells fire. Okay. So it turns out that there's 60 different genes in the chromosomes of the fly which make these odor receptors, okay? And they're scattered over the X chromosome, the second chromosome, and the third chromosome, 60 of these genes. Each one of these little arrows is a gene. And each one makes uh, a receptor which can bind to an odor. All right, so now it turns out um, an important question to ask here is which cells is, are gonna make which receptors, okay? And it's, um, there's a, a beautiful way of asking this question. It's a, some technology that originally was developed right here at Yale in the Klein Biology Tower by a wonderful professor named Joe Gall a number of years ago. And I'm not going to go over the details of it, but basically what it allows you to do is that you can stain with a nice color all the cells that are making a particular receptor. So this is odor receptor 47A. And the cells that make that receptor all get turned purple according to this series of chemical reactions that you do. And the point I want to make here is that different receptors, like this odor receptor 22B, um, are made by different subsets of cells. So these are different cells from these. All right? So each receptor is made by a different subset of cells, and different um, receptors are made by different subsets. So now the interesting point is that this, these patterns of cells that we've determined through sort of molecular biology, looking at molecules, is very reminiscent of the patterns of cells that we saw through all these functional tests we did, where we're actually measuring electrophysiologically, like sticking an electrode in, and seeing which neurons respond to which odors. And so that raised the question is, what sort of correspondence is there between these receptors and these cells? All right, so in other words, which receptors are made by which cells? And to do that, we've done a project that I want to tell you about, which is a whole lot of fun, I have to say, in which we mapped odors to receptors and receptors to neurons. Okay, so basically we're figuring out which um, odors are, uh, stimulate which receptors, which do they bind to and which do they activate, and which of these receptors are made by which of these cells. So we're trying to get uh, to understand how this system is all put together at the molecular and cellular level. To do this, um, we used a, a mutant, a mutant of Drosophila. Remember I said one of the great things about Drosophila was it has fantastic genetics and there are all these mutants out there? Well, we used a mutant which had a little deletion in one of its chromosomes. The second chromosome is a tiny little deletion. That means it's just missing a part of its chromosome. And what it's missing includes this odor receptor 22A gene. So it's missing one of these odor receptors. And we noticed that in this mutant that was lacking one odor receptor, one particular one of these nerve cells, a nerve cell that normally responds to ethyl butyrate, that nerve cell loses response to everything. So if you take away this receptor, this cell can no longer respond to anything. And we call this, this uh, neuron here, this mutant neuron, the empty neuron. Now, of course, it's not really empty. It's got plenty of stuff in it, but it's missing its receptor. So we call it the empty neuron, which turns out to be very convenient. And what you can do, okay, so here's a normal neuron which normally expresses the 22A receptor and responds to ethyl butyrate. In this mutant we have, um, you lose that receptor and you lose response to all odors. 
Well, it turns out through genetic engineering, some, some actually fairly straightforward stuff, you can get this neuron to make another receptor, ORX. So you basically substituted ORX for 22A. And then you can ask, when you put in this other receptor, what, it, what does this neuron now do? What odors does it respond to? Instead of responding to ethyl butyrate, does it respond to something different? And you can do that by sticking one of these electrodes inside and actually asking which odor will get this neuron to fire to make responses. Okay, so here's our empty neuron that doesn't respond to anything at all. And then we put in this odor receptor 7A. And what happens is now all of a sudden we get a strong response to E2 hexanal. And that smells just like grass, you know, the grass in July when you're running across the grass. That's what E2 hexanol smells like. So this receptor then seems like it's a, a receptor for this grass odor. And interestingly, this pattern here of responses, you know, a little bit weaker response to one hexanol. So we're measuring the number of spikes per second, the, the electrical activity we get when we give each of these odors. And this overall pattern looks very much like the pattern we saw with one of these um, the nerve cells we characterized in the, the normal animal, the normal fly. So the simplest interpretation of all this then is that this receptor responds to E2 hexanal and that this nerve cell normally expresses this receptor, it makes that receptor. Okay? Let me show you another example. Here's when we put this 59B receptor in this empty neuron, we now get a strong response to ethyl acetate and to 2,3-dibutanone in a pattern that looks very much like this nerve cell here. When we put the 10A receptor in, we got a, a very strong response to wintergreen. That smells just like those little lifesavers, those wintergreen ice savers. So 10A is a receptor for wintergreen lifesavers. And that looks very much like um, this pattern. And finally, when we put the 82A receptor in, we get a strong response to the odor of rose. So this looks like a rose receptor, and it's a pattern that looks very much like that of this neuron. So we got this to work for, for most of the receptors, not all of them, but most of them. And from all the, the data, putting it all together, we could make a receptor to neuron map of the fly antenna. So we figured out, and we filled in this map later. But anyway, now we, we know which receptors are made by which cells. So this approach also asked us, allowed us to ask a, a very important question about how odors are identified across all the receptors, all the nerve cells of a whole olfactory system. Okay, so how is it that you actually figure out that there's banana over there and apple over there? Well, um, what we did was we took um, all the receptors, and this is work done by a fantastic graduate student named Alyssa Hallam, who, who systematically put, tested all these receptors in this empty neuron system. This is a whole lot of work. And she tested all of them against this panel of diverse odors. All right, and what she found was that there were some receptors that responded to lots of the odors. So they were sort of broadly tuned. They're responding to lots of different things. And other receptors responded only to one or none. So they looked like they were more narrowly tuned. They're more picky, more specific in what they're going to respond to. And if you look at this from the point of view of the odor, okay, there were some odors that activated lots of receptors and some that activated only one. So the bottom line from all this, the take home message then is that different odors will activate different subsets of receptors, different groups of receptors. And remember, each one of these receptors is in a different nerve cell. So in other words, each odor will, will activate, um, different odors will activate different subsets of these nerve cells. So the brain gets different information according to which odors out there. The brain can identify an odor based on which uh, subset of these receptors are being activated. Okay? Now, I know you, you guys come in a whole distribution of young people here and older people, and um, so I want to just spend two minutes telling you something that is for sort of more the, the, the high school students, and then I'll come back, and uh, this will only take a couple minutes. Another way of sort of showing all this kind of data is to um, kind of create what we call an odor space, all right? So what I've done here is I've drawn a three-dimensional graph where the x-axis here represents the response of just one receptor in spikes per second, the 47A receptor. The y-axis represents the response of the 85B receptor. And the z-axis represents the response of the 10A receptor. And what you can do is you can plot in this space each odor. So here, 2-heptanone and pentyl acetate actually map very close together in this three-dimensional space uh, constructed from three receptors. And methyl salicylate maps way far away. All right? 
Now this is just three receptors, a three-dimensional space. So how about a, um, if you make a space con uh, constructed out of the responses of all the receptors, all 24 of them? Well, it's kind of hard to see a 24-dimensional space. I can't draw that very well. But there's some, some math you can do to take a 24-dimensional space and kind of represent it in three dimensions. And when you do that, this is what you get. You find that, again, pentyl acetate and uh, two heptanone okay, map very, very close together. And methyl salicylate maps far apart. So this raises an interesting question. Basically what we're saying, sort of the, the bottom line of all this, is that pentyl acetate and 2-heptanone are very similar in terms of the patterns of receptor activity that they elicit across the whole repertoire of receptors. So does that mean that the fly, to the fly, 2-heptanone and pentyl acetate smell very, very similar, and that methyl salicylate smells very different? All right? Well, so we're actually testing that in the lab now, but, but I, I find this kind of provocative because to me personally, 2-heptanone and pentyl acetate smell very similar, whereas methyl salicylate smells very different. Okay, and this morning when you're coming in, I'm just one person, I kind of wanted to know, you know, I'd like to know whether um, other people feel that way as well. So I put out vials uh, labeled A, B, and C, and I guess a bunch of you actually smelled A, B, and C, and I asked Aaron to sort of take note whether most people thought one of these odors smelled different from the other two. And, um, So Erin told me she would tell me which one, which odor people thought smelled different from the other two. Erin <laughs> has a flair for drama, as you can tell. Okay, and the odor that people thought was different um, was A, and A was methyl salicylate. Well, good job, guys. Which color was A? Uh, don't remember. Green. Green. Okay. So did that smell different to you? Yeah. Good. All right. Good. You know, I actually have to say, I did this test once on a bunch of Yale faculty members who are older and, you know, some of them are kind of going downhill. Oh, well. <laughs> Can you erase that from the videotape? <laughs> But anyway, and, and I have to say, though, virtually everybody, all the, the Yale professors thought that this odor smelled very different. But the interesting thing is that there's uh, this guy, uh, Andy Hamilton, who's a chemistry professor now, who's now our provost, the, university, the Yale University provost. So uh, he raised his hand and said, John, you know, 2B smelled a lot to me like 2-heptanone. Is that right? And, you know, I couldn't tell. To me, they smell the same thing. But I, I looked through all my notes and, and uh, found out that, sure enough, the guy was right. And so my conclusion from that is that that's why he's the university provost. <laughs> and the rest of us are just ordinary faculty members. <laughs> okay, so all of this is a way of identifying the um, odor quality, what kind of an odor is out there. But it's also very important for an animal to be able to evaluate odor quantity, how much of an odor is out there. And that's important because as an animal, as, as an insect is flying towards a food source or towards a mate, um, it has to know whether the odor is becoming stronger or weaker. So how does it do that? Okay, and, and you know, this is a problem for us, too. I'm sure you've had this, this, you know, this things happen where you catch a whiff of an odor and you're trying to figure out where it's coming from. It can be very perplexing. As a matter of fact, I saw this here. Tell Mrs. Pomeroy we found the source of that strange hint of musk. <laughs> so here's how insects do it, we think. So what we did is we systematically tested all these odors against all the receptors, initially at a very high concentration, and we found that most of these odors elicited a, a moderate or strong response from most of the receptors. Okay, so this gives a, a profile that looks very much like New York City, looks like the Manhattan skyline, right? If you dilute the amount of odor by a hundredfold, okay, you now get a sparser representation. There are fewer strong responses, fewer odors. Um, elicit strong responses and the responses tend to be weaker. So you get a, a profile that looks like Philadelphia. If you then go down another two orders of magnitude to, to another hundredfold, um, you get even a, a sparser representation. It looks more like Hartford. And if you go down still another hundredfold, you get Ames, Iowa, <laughs> which is actually the town that I was brought up in. So the basic uh, take-home message from this then is we think that an animal can distinguish how much of a, an odor is out there 
based on how many strong responses it, is, uh, it gets across all these receptors and how strong those responses are. All right. Now, I want to move on to the uh, last part of my talk here. I mentioned earlier that insect olfaction is tremendously important in the real world, in part because hundreds of millions of people every year suffer these miserable infections that they get from, um, that are transmitted by, uh, by insects, which find us through the sense of smell. And one of the worst of these is malaria. Okay, there's 500 million cases of malaria a year, and it's transmitted by this uh, mosquito here, Anopheles gambiae, which has been called the most dangerous animal in the world. So here's a mosquito that's just landed on someone, and here's, this is before he's eat it, he, she, she, it's the females that actually um, bite and uh, take egg, take uh, blood from us for their, they need it to nourish their eggs. So here's before the meal, and here's after the meal. Okay. And um, actually, it's a little warm in here. So. Different part of my talk here. Okay, so <coughs> what happens? Well, the female, when she bites us, she actually delivers some of these little, these little parasites which move into liver cells, okay, and then they come out of liver cells and then infect blood cells, all right? And then they come out of the blood cells, and then if another mosquito comes and uh, bites us, the, she will take up some of these parasites okay and then deliver them to another person so that's how the disease is transmitted from one person to another but the bottom line what's uh, the essential step is that the female mosquito has to smell us and find us okay and just to, to underline the importance of this there's over uh, a million malaria deaths uh, worldwide each year it's just a terrible terrible disease okay and the mosquito has a, an olfactory system here's the antenna covered with sensilla and it turns out that this mosquito uh, has 79 different odor receptors. All right, well, this empty neuron system I told you about works so well with looking at the receptors of the fruit fly, we thought we would just give it a try and see whether it might work with an odor receptor from a mosquito. So remember, here's our empty neuron, which basically doesn't respond to any of these odors we tried. Well, we put in the very first odor receptor from the mosquito that we, we identified called AGOR1 for Anopheles Gambier Odor Receptor 1. And we tried a whole bunch of chemicals and nothing happened in this empty neuron system, okay? But then my grad student, Melissa, pulled a few more chemicals off the shelf and one of them, 4-methylphenol, elicited a screaming response, one of the strongest responses we've ever seen to any odor in any receptor. And that was interesting because although we didn't know it at the time, we found out that this is actually a component of human sweat, okay? And even more provocative is that this receptor here is a female-specific receptor. It's only the females that make this receptor. The males don't make it, and it's only the females that navigate towards humans and bite us, okay? So that raised the possibility that this could be part, at least, of the, the system that the mosquito uses to actually find uh, the human host that she, be, that she um, lands on and to whom she transmits malaria. All right, so what we've been doing more recently then is to systematically go through, the, we're systematically going through all 79 of these uh, odor receptors from the mosquito. And so far, every single one of them has worked, with one exception. And when I say worked, we've been able to find compounds that either excite these receptors or inhibit them. And that's interesting because it's possible that some of these compounds that excite these receptors could be useful uh, in developing new mosquito traps. If you mix together some compounds that very, very uh, potently attract mosquitoes, this could be useful to make some new mosquito traps. Um, and also, uh, compounds that inhibit these receptors um, could be useful in designing new mosquito repellents. All right, so what we're doing now is we actually have a, a nice collaboration with five groups, um, and compounds that we identify here at Yale that activate or inhibit these receptors um, are then tested in a lab in Holland, which is very good at measuring the response of mosquitoes in a wind tunnel. So it asks whether they actually attract them or repel them in a lab. And compounds that look useful there are then tested down in Tanzania and East Africa, um, where we have some collaborators who can test the flight of mosquitoes in a more natural situation out in the, the savanna. And then 
Um, compounds that look interesting there are then tested uh, in the Gambia in a little village which has huts where you can set up so you can measure um, the rate at which mosquitoes fly in and out of huts. So I can think of uh, a whole bunch of reasons why this may possibly not actually work, but the way what I tell myself is that with a disease that affects 500 million people a year, if we can come up with something that will just reduce the incidence by 0.1 percent, there'll be 500,000 people that we're helping. So I figure it's worth trying. All right, so just to summarize what I've told you today, um, I told you, uh, give you an introduction to olfaction and showed you how we could find which odors um, activate which receptors, which receptors are located in which nerve cells, which gave us a receptor to neuron map of the fly olfactory system. I showed you that different odors, indicated by these different dots here, elicit different patterns of activity among all the receptors taken together, and that uh, this could be used by the animal to identify odor quality, which odor is out there. And it could possibly also be useful in seeing, making uh, predictions about which odors are easy for an animal to discriminate. Odors that are very close may be hard to discriminate. I also showed you that lower concentrations of odors elicited a sparser representation in, in, uh, among the receptor repertoire, which provides a means of identifying odor quantity. And last, I showed you that mosquitoes, uh, mosquito receptors can actually function in a fly, and that we use this to identify a female-specific receptor that responds to a component of human sweat. So where does all this kind of work get done? Where, 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 what sort of situations this happen? Well, most of the work I talked to you about today was actually done right here on Klein Biology Tower, which you're familiar, right up here on the 11th floor. And the kind of people who actually have done these experiments are wonderful people who came to Yale from all over the world. Uh, Marine de Bruyne came from Holland and did most of the work on the cellular basis of odor coding. That is, we measured all those different neurons and figured out which they responded to. Peter Klein, who came from New York but actually grew up in India, and Coral War came from Australia. <coughs> and they worked together to actually find these odor receptors in insects. Um, a lot of work in science gets done through collaboration. There's something that we know how to do, but there's something we don't know how to do, but you have a friend at a different university knows how to do it, so you get together and you send a lot of emails and get together and talk over the phone, and together there's a synergy and you can do things that neither lab could do by itself. Jun Young Kim has been a wonderful collaborator who helped a whole lot with some critical parts of this study. <coughs> Anya Dobritza, a graduate student who came to us from Russia, just south of Moscow, and uh, another do Dutch postdoc, Wienan Vanderhoes van Naders, uh, pioneered this empty neuron system. But most of the work on the empty neuron system and the first Drosophila work, <coughs> the first work on mosquitoes was done <coughs> by a fantastic grad student named Alyssa Hallam who came from California. And other parts of the story that I haven't talked about today um, were done by uh, people from uh, all over, the, uh, from other parts of the world. So I just wanted to say thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah. I think the main effect of quinine is on the parasite itself. <coughs> but there's been a very interesting study recently showing that, um, it was just published a few months ago, it's related to that, which your question raises, and that is that um, there's evidence that people who are infected with malaria are more attractive to mosquitoes. And that kind of makes sense because um, for the parasite's point of view, uh, if it wants to propagate itself, it's, it would be a good idea to make something which is going to attract a mosquito, which will then carry it to another person that it can grow in and then keep going. So it's turned out to be very interesting, this relationship between the um, attraction to the mosquito and the parasite itself. <coughs>
butterflies and moths from all over the world, some tropics and stuff, and some huge rhinoceros beetles. There are also some really cool ones in here um, that you can take a look at. And I brought some other species of various insects here that are alive. And this is a terrific uh, rhinoceros beetle from Malaysia. And then there's some live uh, moths and butterflies from Africa over there. Yeah? Are there, there are strange <coughs> things happening to uh, bees? <coughs> a lot of bees disappear. And if, if it relates something to like <coughs> manipulation, get a bigger manipulation for the uh, plants, or, or if you can tell us something about it, what, if, you, if you know what's happening. Yeah, I think there's been a, um, what I understand is there's been a parasite that's been infecting a lot of bees. And that's a big problem because we depend um, on bees to pollinate crops. And so if the bee population goes into a tailspin, we're in big trouble. And the bee olfactory system is, is really terrific. Uh, that's got, um, it's even more sophisticated, I think, than the fly olfactory system. It's got um, a lot of receptors and a lot of little places in the brain for them to wire to. And the bees are capable of learning all kinds of odors very well. So it's a remarkable olfactory system in a species that's got a lot of importance for the real world. Yeah? Yeah. Do they have to They're trying to train the bees. Yeah, every once in a while I get a call from someplace like DARPA, you know, the defense people who want to see if we can train bees to detect of, you know, terrorists and, and also mines, mines, uh, landmines, because there's an unbelievable number of landmines buried all over the world, and that's a real problem. So there's interest in sort of seeing whether you can get insects, which have these terrific senses of smell, to actually find where the landmines are, are buried, and then you could deactivate them. And also to use in airports, you know, to find. So this, there has been a lot of interest, in, in these DARPA people show up every once in a while and want to talk about that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, where do mosquitoes go during the winter? Where, where do what go? Mosquitoes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think they. <laughs> They ha go through a process called diapause, where they sort of shut down. It's kind of like hibernation. And, um, so, but you know, it's amazing how little we know about that. You know, there's thousands of people who study these insects in labs. And I think that's a great question that, that yeah, yeah, and there's very, very little information about it. When I first got into this field, I kept asking that too. I was asking about fruit flies. You know, where do all the fruit flies go? And nobody could give me a good answer. They said, well, they hang out in their garbage cans or something. But, but yeah, it was 20 degrees below zero. And, I, and I, I don't know how many of them make it, but some of them definitely do. And the way they do it is they sort of shut down and go into this hibernation mode where I think they make these antifreeze proteins in their, their blood to help them make it through the winter. But, but we know vanishingly little about that. And I think it's a really exciting topic for future research. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yes. Right. Uh, aside from repelling mosquitoes from humans, does any of this, um, any of these findings have applications to repel pests from crops? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and there's a couple of ways of doing that. Um, actually, I think attractants are probably the best way to use in agriculture. And, and it actually, they already have been used successfully in some cases where you can um, put a whole lot of an attractant in a field. And so the, the insects that are in the area, if it's a very potent attractant, will go in and get trapped in that attractant. So there's, there's actually been a lot of interest. In fact, what they do is they actually have sometimes what they call bait crops. They'll have one row of crops that's got something very attractive, and they just sacrifice that. They let the animals eat that. Um, but in the hopes of sparing all the other rows of crops. Yeah, but this is big business, man. I mean, there's this you know, b billion dollar agricultural industry. And you, I showed you all these pictures of these insects just trashing these things. So there's real opportunities here for, for using what we've learned about molecular and cellular biology to come up with new ways of, of approaching these problems. Okay, well, let's thank Professor Carlson for Thank you.